In this episode of the Business of E-Commerce, I talk with Dr. James Richardson about what causes exponential growth. This is the Business of E-Commerce, episode 157. Welcome to the Business of E-Commerce, the show that helps e-commerce retailers start, launch, and grow the e-commerce business. I'm your host, Charles Pulaski, and I'm here today with Dr. James Richardson. James is a founder of Premium Growth Solutions, a strategic plan consultancy for early stage consumer packaged good brands. As a professionally trained cultural anthropologist turned business strategist, he has helped more than 75 CPG brands with their strategic plans. Some of those brands include, read them off air, Hershey's, General Mills, Kraft Food, Frito-Lay, uh, it, list goes on here. He's helped a lot of brands and he's super interesting take on growing the business and what to really focus your time and attention on. And I think that's a big thing here on if you really want to double down, he kind of talks about here's the exact segment and here's how you should find that segment and who you should be focusing on. So I think that part's super helpful on really kind of nailing who to focus on if you want to be able to really scale your business and see that year over year exponential growth. So let's get into the show. And I think he has some great tips. Also, he links to his book at the end that we'll link in the show notes. So let's check that out. So, hey, James, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you doing, Charles? Doing good. Awesome to have you on the show. Why? Thank you. To uh, dig in this topic a bit, we're talking earlier about um, exponential growth and how there's some DCC brands that seem to get it and others wish they got it and others never do. Um, <laughs> and it seems to be this like magic formula, people think, but you've kind of talked about this a bit. So curious to kind of get your thoughts on that. Yeah, so I um, I do work with a mix of D2C and, and retail only brands, but I think what I what we were just chatting about, I think before we hit record, was that I meet a lot of D2C folks who, thanks to the internet itself, uh, are well versed in, in all the KPIs of D2C business management, uh, and they're they're drowning in data and lifetime value and average order value and all this stuff, but they try to measure the health of their business purely within the context of those data points, which are coming in through Shopify, essentially. Uh, yeah. But they're not necessarily asking at any point, even if they're doing well, which is actually just as important in my view, asking what, why are people repeating? Yep. Uh, what behaviorally is attracting them to like constant purchase? on a monthly basis to, or weekly basis, if you're really lucky <laughs> um, and you're able to sell like drinks to people or stuff. But I mean, if you're not asking the question, why are people repeating? It's going to be very hard, Charles, to put together a, any kind of like marketing playbook, whether that marketing is purely online or online and offline, uh, that is going to have the right messaging and have the right symbolism to find, to create more of those repeaters out there in the universe. Right. Yeah. In other I words, of, so there's two basic, of, there's two basic approaches to fast growth. And I think D to C you've seen it too. I'm sure in your client base is basically there. So to raise a bunch of cash and buy a ton of trial through, through newsfeed ads and just, just ramp the trial up through the roof. <laughs> and if I get repeat, well, that's, that's okay. <laughs> But <laughs> yeah, so that's the, uh, the stars way to do it. You kind of just juice right. the numbers. And if you get enough yeah. people coming to the site, you'll, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna yeah, and I think <laughs> some people are gonna check whole, out. There's a whole, I mean, in Silicon Valley, there's a whole crowd of investors. That's the, basically their model. Yep. Like they don't actually worry about lifetime value or annual revenue per user. They, they worry about user count, user flow, acceleration of trial, all this stuff, all the front end of the business the front end of top line, but what's keeping the top line, what determines if a top line goes exponential is repeat and the quantity of it and how much those repeat people are buying. Because if you can get 10% of your customer base, Charles, to buy you monthly while everyone else is dabbling, the 90% and half of them never come back. But if you can get 10% to repeat on a monthly basis and they're spending, you know, they're buying like a half a case or case of your product and that's how they buy online in my, my world and consumer package goods. <laughs> I want a case of spin drift and otherwise I'm not coming to your website. I don't want one can. Yep. So I want a case of spin drift um, and I want it every bloody month. <laughs> 
And those consumers end up creating an enormous amount of annual revenue for that brand, right? If they can actually pull that off. Now, Spindrift does it through Amazon, not D to C. And that's smart for logistic reasons. But even if you were doing a D to C, the question is, who are those people and what is it about them so that you can go out into the white space of the population and, and find more people like that by learning the behavior of the people who generate that kind of profitability for you. And what makes it exponential is that you don't, um, you don't have to add nearly as many of those people to start to bend your top line up exponentially. Uh, and if you can grow that number, like say you, say you have a repeat heavy user rate of like 5% in the beginning, and then you get it up to 10% in a year and then it's up. Um, and then as you scale that group, uh, you can, and scale their frequency as well. You, you actually can accelerate your business to scale much, much faster than buying trial. More importantly, you can do it for f like far less money. <laughs> I see. Well, and the thing about that is if you know there's this one type of customer, right? That, right. you know, you have your customer, your tire set, 100% of them, but you know there's this 5% and they're the 5% percent they are going to repeat. You could spend astronomically more to market on just that 5% because, you know, that first sale, you can... Yeah. You could lose on that. Who cares? But yeah. you're going to make it up and sell. Well, six. that's a great. That's a great point that you raise because I often work. I often I don't work with a lot of startups myself. Um, but when I do, I, I dialogue with them online on LinkedIn Live and other fora where I show up, and I and they often ask me about you know should I spend? <laughs> we're talking brands that are selling like two hundred grand trailing, right? Should I spend on Instagram ads? And um, you know, and if they're in retail, I basically say no. Um, uh, in most cases, because they're not in a category in my industry, the category is so important because it depends how frequently it's consumed and bought. So like people drink bottled water, people who have bottled water in their home drink it at a base level of frequency. And then the heavy users will drink it like three bottles a day. This week's episode is sponsored by Pricing. Pricing is a competitor price tracking and repricing tool that helps e-commerce companies make intelligent pricing decisions. Using their dashboard and daily Excel reports, online sellers can monitor price changes and immediately make pricing adjustments. Here are some features that I love about Pricing. First is Smart Match. What Smart Match does is allows Pricing to search for your competitors and attach their prices right on your dashboard so you can monitor their pricing changes against competitors you already know about. They find competitors you didn't even know existed. Once you have that, you can configure your repricing rules. What this does is you can now set your prices to be based on the average price, the lowest price, the highest price of your competitors, go up and down. And also you can say, don't go lower than my cost by plus $5. Whatever you want to do, you can set these rules and pricing will automatically adjust your prices. Next is price change notifications. You can set rules to when prices change, Pricing will send you a notification alerting you of your competitor's pricing changes. And last but not least is a price history. You can then go in to the dashboard and look up all the pricing changes over time that pricing has been monitoring. That way you know just because it's lower today, they might just be having a sale and it might come back tomorrow. You can see all your competitors on one chart. Super cool. I urge you to check it out. Thanks again for pricing for sponsoring this week's episode. Now back to the show. What would be an example of a category when you say like just a, the retail so out in that so sort of category? So how, it's how you shop a grocery store. So like soda mm. versus packaged rice versus potatoes. Versus, so it's how you shop a grocery store basically. And and the problem is that in food and beverage and CBG, the, the rates of consumption, they, there's an enormous continuum um, yeah. in how fast you empty a container, how many containers you buy on a shopping trip, whether it's online or offline. So... I meet a lot of people who are like, I don't know, they're selling like gluten-free cookie mix, right? That stuff doesn't move, right? The heavy users actually don't even buy it that much. <laughs> so, no, seriously, if you study them, it's just a snail category. And so it's a really bad, bad category to invest in paid advertising of any kind, especially online, because, you know, you do the water, if you do the advertising thing, like $8 for a, an Instagram click, you basically have to spend two to $300 to get a repeat user. 
but they're not buying and they're not buying enough every year, Charles, of the gluten free brownie mix to make your money back. And just <laughs> but when you sell a case of Spindrift, it literally only takes you about three months to make all is your there, ad money back. <laughs> so. Is there even for those guys though? Because when you start thinking about that, maybe there is some. Okay, there's a tiny little number of gluten free. Um, muffin shops, right? That they're going to just, they need to buy the stuff every week. And if you identified that one avatar on like, you know, we don't sell to gluten-free, like regular people, we sell just to gluten-free bakeries. And there you go. maybe, yeah. Yeah. right. They're yeah. going to, they might have to buy multiple cases per week. Yeah. Like I was even, that's the way, talking. and that's the way you think yourself out of those traps. Right. Cause so, so something like something like, uh, an ingredient category often like the end consumer is actually not the wisest target audience. Like you just, yeah. re- it's actually a business is probably a better target audience. So. A business or even <laughs> like uh, one example, when you were just talking, I was just kind of throwing some notes down on when, when would this, would it work? Right. Like when is this not a good idea? And it's kind of, I like to frame it in both ways. Right. Right. And I started thinking, well, okay, let's say I'm a, a bed retailer, right? Like, yeah. you know, I bought one bed like 15 years ago and I just bought another one. But then I started thinking, well, if I had, you know, um, I know some folks that have multiple Airbnbs, Right. They have several of them and they're constantly, they have, you know, three bedroom houses and they have multiple three mm-hmm. bed houses mm-hmm. and the beds in a year get destroyed. So they just, they just turn through beds. I'm thinking if you just targeted, you know, so you could spend for that click tons of money on just Absolutely. Airbnb owners, right? Absolutely. And you sell your bed as an Airbnb bed. Yep. There's your avatar. So the, I work in an industry with very low unit pricing. So every sale, the average sale is about 250 Okay. In the United States. And this is for, this consumer is, packaged goods? Yeah. I mean, it's like, okay. it's, it basically, it's worthless. So it's, yep. it's super dependent on volume sales before anyone starts taking money. And so it's a very strange, it has a very high standard for paid ad return. Um, but what's interesting is you can actually, if you sell soft drinks or like beer, even as a startup, you can actually develop a really nice return, even if you're only in retail, because at that $8 click, all you have to, if you can create 10% heavy user with a fantastic product that people really like, you know, you spend, you might spend three to $400 to get every heavy user, but they're buying like a case a month. So you're going to make it all back during one year. And if you can keep them for two years or three years in your brand, now you're making money. And along yeah. the, and along the way, you bring some dabblers and triers, and they pay the cost of the ad. Um, but when you're when you're in something that's bought very infrequently, uh, and not in large volume, <laughs> yep. that's when people get in trouble. But yeah, like if you have a super high ticket durable good, like a mattress, the frequency of the purchase doesn't matter because you're going to get that advertising return. Um, yep. But I, I was thinking, like I have a I have a friend who sells a really great tasting mixed nut. But he just, it, people don't buy jars of mixed nuts that often. They just don't anymore. They did in the 80s. People used to plow through them. <laughs> it's just not an on-trend category. And so he can't do anything about that cultural background. And so you know, he would never get the return because his average person's probably buying three, four jars a year. That's so what would, say to, <laughs> that's yeah, what would you say to that? That's a user. <laughs> what would you say to those folks? Would you be, hey, let's like let's find the, you know, mixed nut connoisseurs or like, what would you recommend to that person if they're, if they're already in that category? So fine, maybe they shouldn't get into that category today, but if they're already there and they have an established brand, how could they start really like hammering down on that target market? I think that, you know, they're, um, they may have some constrained playbook options, uh, and paid advertising is not going to be one of them. So they're going to have to leverage cheaper digital techniques to get word of mouth. Uh, and, and for companies that don't have the ability to, they don't have a category that's amenable to a lot of out of store acceleration, which is soft drinks and beer and liquor and, and snacks and like nutrition bars and life and like at lifestyle and athletic kind of products. Um, then they're going to have to be more patient and stay in one city and build the business up there before they go crazy. And that's, I see people get in my industry, they, they get frustrated because they realize, oh yeah, I'm the mixed nut guy and I don't have a lot of, op- I don't have the options of a spin drift. I don't have the yeah. playbook options. And, and I, I know that because I've studied up on this, but then they go and do crazy stuff like fire themselves out nationally. They try to ramp up stores and distribution. Um, when in reality they would probably be better off. Uh, going to a third party site like Amazon, which has the most eye- eyeballs and consumer packaged goods in the world and just working an advertising algorithm 
where you can actually get a meaningful return because you'll find it's easier on Amazon, for example, to find the mixed nut geek who like wants to buy a gallon of cool mixed nuts. Trying to find them at your average grocery store, it's going to be it's beyond a needle in a haystack. So, but they're on yeah. Amazon. <laughs> I, I think I think that's what gets people like sucked in, right? Because you go to conferences, you're in blog posts, you hear all these success stories, and you hear, you know, higher up my business from, wow. you know, zero to 100 million a year using paid ads, and they show this this company, and they've like hit it out of the park, and you're like, cool, I should do that. And then you have someone else like, how I've gone from zero to 100 million using content marketing, you're like, cool, I should do that. And you're basically getting whiplash with all these different techniques because you're looking at you know, oh, these. Oh yeah, they did yeah. it using content marketing, um, paid, uh, you know, PPC, social, and you kind of look at all these different things. You're like, cool, we should do a little all of that. And you always kind of see, okay, the companies that do real well are the ones who find that like fit on. You're the you know the nut retailer, yeah. And which of these channels makes the most sense? Yep. It just ignore everything else initially and just go yeah. and go and just hammer down on that channel. But I, but I do think since most people are having a mediocre time, in, if you look at the average startup that's trying to grow in any industry, it's really important to ask is to go out there as you're struggling and have the uh, maturity and the objectivity to go and inquire why with people who are either rejecting you. And, and the nice thing, if you're D2C, you can actually find the rejectors, right? Because they bought. And then they never bought again and you have their email address. So it's like you can actually go out and learn what was it that caused you to stop buying. And then you can compare that with your repeat purchases and see, oh, I see the contrast between these two groups. And now I know more about this other group, my repeaters. They're the high value people. Um, I now maybe know a little bit more about them psychologically or sociologically, which is sort of my background. Um, and now I have some variables that can go out into Facebook campaign, campaign manager or uh, – you know, which is the most, which is the cheapest tool to use in absolute terms and go find and use the targeting variable with, you know, wizardry of Facebook ad manager, which is amazing. I mean, the, the level of nuance that you can target is crazy, but you have to know what to look for. Right. And if you don't study the people who are making you the most money today, you're not going to efficiently scale your business really well. So like I have a client who's selling Swedish dishcloths and, and she struggled in retail initially. Um, these are these beautiful sort of bamboo woven. They're totally compostable, by the way. You can just, they just biodegrade in like 30 days. So, so it's not like the nylon dishcloth you get at Target, which is, yeah. <laughs> will last forever in the landfill. It only costs a buck 50. <laughs> yeah. cost a fortune, but they're, they're, and she's a designer. She's an artist. So she put, she put, draws designs and they get printed on them. So you end up having this piece of art in your kitchen sink, not just some ugly rack. <laughs> so it's a very interesting, she's found a space where there's no art in the American kitchen and she's like cutting boards, dishcloths. And so she's putting design on them and she's just created this Facebook, Instagram flywheel. And it took her like two years to figure it out and to figure out through some research, light research, you know, how, who these, who these women were that were interested in having design in these bizarre objects that no one else cares about, but man, do they buy a lot of stuff from her? <laughs> so, I mean, but, we're talking orders like $150 in order, $200 in order. So the order value of these people, and they're buying like five, six times a year. And the real geeks are buying, they're buying like a thousand dollars a year in gifts for other people. Yeah. So she's got, she's got these super valuable people. And she found out as she started to experiment with social media, Charles, that, oh, they, they love the artistic component, but they really, the reason they kept camping back to her site was because they kept seeing her do videos and Facebook live and all this. They just liked her. They wanted to interact with her. They basically yep. wanted to have her over for tea. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then they just start throwing money at her. And then I'm like, I was like, yes, you have figured this out because the biggest asset you have is that was an unknown brand. I mean, you don't target, right? You don't have this mega retail brand behind you, but you have, you have the ability to create a relationship with people. And, you know, no big company is ever going to waste their time doing that. Nobody's well, and it's funny because Target <laughs> does that just on a much smaller level, right? You see it about the steward brand that they have collections and they find someone that's already that's popular. Her, and that's, that's her goal is we want to get, yeah. I want to get her into Target, but she's got to ramp this thing up so that it seems viable to them. Right. But she's, she's well on her way. I mean, she's got a national base of people and it's growing exponentially, but it's growing, it's growing exponentially off a small base. And that's what I want to talk to your listeners about, because I think when we read the zero to hundred million in a year and a half, which still happens, 
I mean, it really does. It's just, it's not as common as you'd think. Um, yeah. But it, does, it happens enough that people think it's some kind of model. If you slow the pace of to scale down, Charles, a little bit, you want, you arrive at exponential growth. And it, it basically, anybody listening can pull up Excel and see how it works, right? If you could get to half a million in maybe a couple years just struggling, and it'll be slow, you know, but then double every year after that, you can see, you can see the what what I call in my book, Ramping Your Brand, what I call the skate ramp, which is this quarter pipe skate ramp sort of figure. It's basically the S curve in business school. Um, it's the front half of the S curve. And what happens on the S curve is you're scaling, you're doubling every year, but the the top line doesn't look like it's moving. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> it's like the beginning of a skate park ramp. You're not really going up very fast. Um, but then you get halfway up the ramp and suddenly the, the thing is going practically vertical, right? And that's exactly what happens when you can double a business off of uh, heavy user, increasing the heavy user base at a steady clip. And if you can keep doing that every year, you are going to create this exponential curve because they're, they're 10 times more valuable financially than some dude who just randomly buys one off your site. <laughs> Yeah, because doubling every year, right, is six percent a month. When you start thinking, when you start breaking it out in terms yeah. of monthly, it's six yeah. percent month of month growth. And when you yeah, think of six percent of what you did last month, you're like, oh, I, I got that. Like that's achievable. You're not going to have like, you know, logistics issues. Like you can, everyone can ramp up six from what they did thirty days ago, and then that but compounding it, every month. It's easier, it's easier said than done. I can say that this yes. client I'm finding, she struggled in finding the ad content and everything else for about a year and almost gave up. And I just told her to keep pushing because it's like there's an experimental component to it. And she finally found how to communicate with this niche. And now she's doubling down on it. And it's like a machine. And her return on ad spend is phenomenal. I mean, you were talking to somebody who raised almost no money. You're running it out of her house. She's got a return on ad spend that would make a lot of people listening here jealous. <laughs> how do you find those? <laughs> but how do you find those users though? That's the thing. Because let's say you have two checkouts, one by one's from you know Fred, one from Joe. And how do you know that? Like, what do you look at? And you just have Joe at gmail.com and Fred at gmail.com. And what do you like? How are you looking and saying, oh, Joe's you know worth ten times what Fred is? Like, how do you know that going so into us? The way I talk to people who who have the luxury of this data um, is that you want to you you don't want to just study the basic trial repeat split that a lot of DTC people already know about. You need to look at the extended repeat patterns. So you need to look at the smaller group within your repeat group that are buying on a on a, what we would call a cyclical or habitual basis. And some of it could be a mix of, of um, embedded habitual purchasing that has to do with their daily life in combination with seasonal buying, which is what this my dishcloth client has, right? Because she's got a huge Q4 business, obviously. But she's getting all she's getting so much of it from her, her geeks who are buying all year long anyway. <laughs> so it's like she just gets a huge surge from them at the end. Those patterns are something that you have to be able to look at the data at a monthly level and break it out and decompose it over 12 months or look at two years of your data and see where these folks are. Then if you can isolate them, what I tell people is you fire out, you fire out a somewhat cleverly written survey, but even better than a survey, which is dangerous because you tend to ask founders that I work with tend to ask loaded questions and stuff like that. In reality, it'd be better to actually get them on the telephone. And the thing is people never even think about this. They never think about why don't I just call like some of my top customers or send them an email and say, can we have a chat? I mean, I guarantee you 75% of them will say yes. If they've spent like a thousand dollars last year with you, they would absolutely kill to talk to the owner. I mean, yep. think about it. It's like common sense. So you're waiting for these, these people are probably dying to tell you all sorts of stuff. If you could just get them on the phone. It's like a 20th century idea, I know. So do a video call if it has to be 21st century. But it's just like talk to them and listen. Listen to how they talk about how they use your products, how they think about them. That's where the gold comes from in terms of messaging for, to optimize your LinkedIn ads, your Facebook ads. Is you know what are the what are the key attributes of my product or service that I need to highlight? Oh, it wasn't what I thought. You know, I I started this company for X, Y, and Z, but my repeat fans who are spending tons of money every year are telling me no. I don't care that your dishcloths are sustainable. What I care is that blank. I have something pretty mm. to look at in my sink. It's like it's often much more banal and not as interesting as the founder's motive for starting the company. It's often a lot less sexy. Yeah. <laughs> but that will yeah. make people you know, that's what I've always found. 
<laughs> well, you see all the time in subscription business, for example, there's a top line number of churn, right? And everyone kind of talks about what's the churn versus industry average. And when you really break it down, it's almost a useless number, right? Because there's there's these folks signing up that they're going to be that one time, they're going to stick around for a very short time and they're going to churn out. But then there's, what is the actual churn number of that target that you can just like, yeah. you know, once they sign up, they're going to be lifetime users, right? Like, yeah, I mean, what, using what, whatever. when I think of a D2C businesses, the ones I worked in the last couple of years, the, the metrics that, can, the, the numbers that concern me are not standard things discussed on the internet when I go to like how to run a D2C business. <laughs> I get concerned when, um, churn is like more than 90%. Well, yeah, that's a, yes. Right. I get concerned when your repeat customers all churn out after 12 months. Yep. And it's a product that they should be loyal to. There's no reason they shouldn't be. Um, because if you're, if you're spending all this ad money trying to bring people into a brand franchise, you need to keep them around for at least two to three years at some level of repeat purchasing, or you're not you're not accreting layers to your foundation, your business, and you know, which is part of growing the, up this exponential growth curve, right? You've got to keep them at least for two to three years. They'll eventually get bored of you. Yep. I mean, that's sort of, that's the world we live in, in consumer, in a postmodern consumer society. But if you can't keep them for, that's why I've had a couple of clients where they're like, hire, they try, they hire me like six months into their overfunded DDC. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, guys, Things look really good now, but you haven't even been around long enough to look at one of the key KPIs is where are all these people in another seven months, guys? Yeah. Because <laughs> you can, yeah, the, prob the problem with Facebook, turnout. if you have enough money, if you have enough money on Instagram, man, you can, and, and you have good advertising copy, you actually can create a problem, which is you can create a fad. You can yeah. literally create an online fad that will grow really fast. It might even get up, written up by Inc. Magazine as some amazing unicorn. And then 18 months later, it starts collapsing. Yeah, because you don't have you that know, sustainable purchase, you right? You didn't no. wait enough to realize, hmm, I just bought a whole bunch of trial. I didn't really target my advertising at the people who were going to live with this brand and find more of those people. I just used like shock advertising or attention getting advertising to get a whole bunch of orders in my the system, right? And yeah, I, what? I can't name I, names, but there's more than one of these. <laughs> I've talked, I've talked about a bunch of the show where everyone kind of tells you going into it, like you got to sit down and create this like customer avatar and you got to have different and you got to really understand them. And that's like the step that everyone goes, yeah, definitely. And they just skip right over it and they keep going, like, All right, let's not run some Facebook ads. What it means. And I think the pro, I mean, I talk, I'm an anthropologist, so I, I groan because I don't avatar is just, that's the video game version of saying it's yeah. like a grass graphic or personality is the, yep. is the popular, that's the time magazine word. Right. And Americans we're biased towards thinking about behavior psychologically. That's a cultural issue that has nothing to do with reality. We are psychologists are in the media all the time. Um, they're the professors of psychology are much better network. They write a thousand more books than my colleagues do. Um, we have, my colleagues get Malcolm Gladwell to go to the New York library and read our stuff and then write about it. <laughs> so, yep. like, so the social science perspective on this is that you you are um you're actually able to accelerate really fast including with paid advertising if you can find out not only who your repeat customers are and why but if you can find out which highly socially networked subgroup subpopulations in the united states those are usually related to occupation or some kind of recreational activity those two things. Mm -hmm. And I talk about this in my book, Ramping Your Brand. If you can figure out if you've got like some weird skew, like do you have like an abnormal number of surfers <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or whatever it is, and then double down on that group in the early years, you can get wild acceleration because in a tightly networked community of people who love because of the the sacrifices they make to be part of that community, right? Whether it's a job or whether it's a recreational thing. I used to be a mountain biker, for example. So, you know, they will constantly share information within that highly networked group. In fact, they, they have to share information to sustain credibility in the group. Yep. Right? You can't just work. So, uh, so sharing, oh, I found this and da, 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 and this tool and da, da, da. If you can have a relevant product and insert it into one of those highly networked groups, the word of mouth just blows up like crazy. This is how Cliff Bar built itself to a $100 million business in like seven or eight years in the 90s. 
I mean, it's a long gone case study that we've all forgotten about it, but it was all done through the mountain bike community in the West Coast. And it was mostly word of mouth. You didn't buy any marketing. Now, it helps when your founder is a radical, like long haul mountain biking super geek. <laughs> So he probably do it. He probably had a thousand mountain biking friends that he could seed this with. <laughs> hey, he knows that he has that audience already. He goes to those events. He's just yeah. and he's in that world, right? But you're saying if you're if you're not right, like you, let's say you start off day one and you haven't really like nailed this, just start getting some orders, like get some volume coming in. And at some point, then start seeing okay, out of these orders, who are the folks that actually buy it more than once, or who are just like my top ten, top five? Just keep going to that top percent. And then just start researching them and get yeah. plus your data points. Ended phone conversations with your top customers who, you know, why do you use it? And it, it that basic question is sort of counterintuitive to most entrepreneurs. I mean, it's like they know why they founded the company. And it, it seems like a stupid question. Why would I ask them why they're but you have to be that objective. You have to step back and, and presume you have no clue why they're buying it. Cause that's when you might learn something interesting. Like, well, I take this on my mountain biking trips every weekend and you didn't even see that coming. And now you have a clue that, Oh wow, there's maybe a community where I could use these three customers who are mountain bikers to go invade that community. Right. And in the early years, shipping like a free case to someone who's a, who's actually an influencer inside a social tightly organized social network like that is a thousand times more valuable than advertising to, yes to some generic audience even on facebook um but the first but, key is you got to target that audience you got to you, you got to find with that audience and then find that influencer in that find those people in this sub niche yeah you know what it takes charles it takes time yeah that's all it takes nothing i described just costs any money really but people are often so busy operating um, and deluged in operational reality, they don't feel like they have the time to to do some basic stuff. But like, I even have a course on my website that'll teach you how to do this research in like six hours. It's not, it's not super complicated stuff. It actually doesn't take a lot of time. It just feels overwhelming if it's not something you're used to doing. But I really tell people that you want to do it because that's how you can you can accelerate. <sighs> your passage through the doldrums, which most people go through in the early years where they're like, they're not getting the acceleration they need. The ads aren't quite working. They haven't figured it out. And the secret is going to lie with your highly profitable repeat buyers, but you got to be able to get into their lifestyle and understand it's not their psychology that matters. It's how they live their life and how they use who they, who they hang out with and how they promote and use your product in everyday life. And that's the secret um, therein lies the secret of, of finding more of them. But what I found is that a lot of people, fans especially love to talk about, they love to talk with the brand because they're so committed, right? Like, so th this is like the easiest group to research I could possibly imagine. And I, I, I used and to people do, think it's scary. People think they're like not going to answer I, the phone. If you oh, just no, call, no, no, if no. you, if you get an order and I've seen people do this and it <laughs> like works like 90% of the time, 98% of the time you just get an order and it's a high value order. Repeat customer, you just call and you're like, Hey, you know, Mary, I just want to, I saw this order. It's your third order. I just want to double check. You know, we got everything in the package just the way you want it. Uh, you order these three skews. You're like, great. And you're like, by the way, what are you, what are you doing with this stuff? Just like <laughs> yeah. people just start talking and you yeah. could be on the phone for as long as you want. Now there's a, you and I know that there's a sub segment of people who whose barrier to doing that, Charles, is they're actually, could be honest, too arrogant. Hmm. I'll be, yep. I mean, I've met these, you've met them too. You know, I call them the, yep. I call them the D to C bros. <laughs> it's, <just laughs> like, you know, it's just like, come on. Like, yeah, they think if I, I talk to the consumer, then I come off as some stupid little artisan tiddling company and I want to be this big brand from day one. And it's just like, man, you have to earn the right yep. to be that elite. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, you can't just start there. And you don't even necessarily say, hey, I'm the founder. And it's just, no. thing. It's just like, you can hey, say I'm you're just, the janitor. <laughs> you don't even need to say who you are. It's just, hey, I saw you order from XRU site. I'm just checking in. And like most people aren't going to be like, what's your position there? You yeah, know, right, like yeah, no one's going right. to ask that question back at you. They're just going to say, oh, I, I appreciate, like, because not many times you submit an order on Amazon and somebody calls you back and they're like, did you mean to order this? And they're like, Oh, wow. My phone just, right. like, no one's going to actually really be upset if someone calls them. They're just going to say, oh, thanks for calling. Okay. Yes, I did order that. Thank you. And worst thing I'm going to say is I'm going to hurry. And yes, that that's mine. Confirmed. Thanks. Bye. So worst case, just going to get someone going, yes, yeah. and go on with their life. I, Best case, you're going to get a nice conversation out of it. Yeah. And you might, you're going to get some nuggets about, hmm, 
this is why my fans are spending this kind of money and I need to find more people like this. And, and so my sociological advice is, which is also in the book, and I have some other examples in the book too, lifestyle groups, recreational groups, and occupational groups. And the occupational one tends to slip past people because my wife used to be a bedside nurse and that's one of the most jacked in, tightly organized groups. I mean, there's a lot of tension in a nursing, in a nursing ward, but they're, it's like the military. Yep. I mean, I mean, with COVID-19, it's absolutely like the military. I mean, it, it's like the war. So I mean, yeah. these there for all the problems that exist on a nursing ward between the nurses, the reality is they, they are a tightly knit group. They have a tightly knit profession and they net, we're highly networked, highly, highly networked. I, and if you want an example of a, in a career that's not, that would be accounting. <laughs> so if you've ever been at yeah. CPA's office, they all sit in their closed door offices and never talk to each other because they're pathological introverts. Um, and, and their job actually doesn't require them to be co-present. They don't actually do anything together. I mean, why does an accountant need another accountant in his office other than to be yelled at? Not much. So, I mean, the, the job is basically solitary. <laughs> so, uh, but if you, if you look at a certain subset of careers like sales professionals, pharmaceutical sales reps, also hyper networked group. They have massive national conferences. Right? <laughs> I actually advised a client who had a hangover remedy that they needed to, they needed to invade one of these national sales conferences and do field marketing there because they would, they could create 10,000 customers in like one weekend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, well, it's just like <laughs> I was talking to a founder the other day and, um, can't mention the business, but they were talking about how they grow and it was all based on affiliates. And someone else on the call was kind of saying, you know, have used like basically talking about like what affiliates work in their business. And it's just, there's certain types that the consumer, the affiliate is also the consumer. And it's yes. just like, That's it's just flywheel. Yeah. And then there's other ones that they're not, like you said, accountants, like if, <laughs> if you say, I'm going to give my accountant a coupon, uh, a affiliate code, then they're like, well, what are they going to do with this? They don't but talk other to ones, <laughs> yeah, I don't talk to anyone, but there's other ones where the person with the affiliate code talks to more, talks directly to more customers that would become more affiliates that would also be buyers. And it just goes in this crazy flywheel. And if you could find that, it's, yeah, I mean, um, I, they were giving some I, numbers. It's impressive. My industry base, there's a lot of these trade shows where they go and they're, they're really to meet retail buyers and they, you know, they buy an expensive booth and they, they try to meet retail buyers and hand out samples and stuff like that. But I've always laughed because I, I've noticed obliquely as a social scientist walking around those shows that there's an enormous amount of sampling to high value consumers going on because it's like, it could even be me. Like I'm just, I'm not a retailer, so, but I'm walking by taking samples and I might become a customer and I, I have money. I, I probably thought through, I'm going to think when, if there's 10,000 booths in front of me, I'm going to think through which one I bother to have a sample from. Right. So I have plenty of choices. <laughs> so it's like those trade shows, they're actually accumulating new customers. They don't even realize it. Yeah. And that's why I was, I think I blogged once like, don't be a jerk at your trade show booth because the guy talking to wants to talk to you isn't a buyer. I mean, that is the dumbest. Thing. It's like, this could be someone who could hand you a hundred customers if you're just nice to them. <laughs> But there's all these oblique moments, like for instance, the big natural trade shows. I mean, one of the things they bring together is geeks who are into natural organic food. So like every yeah. single person there, it doesn't matter whether they're an ad agency or whatever, everybody there is into that category and they're potentially a high value convert to your brand. So you should look at everybody there as a consumer, not just. Well, and you look at now there's influencers that have yeah. larger, they have larger reach than some, some buyers. So the buyers get you the orders tomorrow, but the influencers can get you, if they like it, they can just, they can hammer down on it and really show it. They have a way larger audience than a buyer ever will, which is amazing. So you, and you don't know who that, you know, fine. They don't work for, you know, XYZ brand, but they have an Instagram with well, how many I, millions of followers. Yeah, I mean, I think there's also, I, I have a, a friend who's running a, a business where they crowd, he crowdsources the fans to go harass the buyers. So basically it creates this gentle neutral portal where the, where fans can say, I want to see, I want to see this new brand, uh, Wegmans or something. Yeah. Um, and suddenly the Wegmans buyer is getting contacted, but in a friendly sort of third party mediated manner. Um, mm. and Giving them the and, tools to yeah, do that. Yeah, yeah. Because I think influencing the buyer obliquely is a huge thing when you're selling in retail. Um, cause they're avalanche. They're like book editors. 
I mean, they're like book publishers. They're av they're avalanched with manuscripts. <laughs> so you're gonna find some way to fight through. <laughs> um, well, and you as a you as a brand, right? You're gonna have you can only hit them so many times. But if yeah. you can have a thousand people each hit them. Uh, you know, that's a force multiplier, right? So now all yeah, of a sudden it's taking your one brand and- And there's there one thing, like a retailer buyer, physical retailer, they, they, they don't lose anything by being miffed and aloof and quite frankly, condescending to a startup who's, who's pestering them, right? They lose nothing because yes. you're replaceable to them, but they can't be that way to 500 of their shoppers or they'll get fucked. Yes. <laughs> So it's just like, so the yeah. shopper has this huge like I'm a loyal Wegmans person. Don't you? You better listen to me. I mean, they do, the good retailers do. Well, if you're a brand, you can't go on social media and say oh, they ignored me and they right. blew me off. But it, <laughs> but a random consumer can, and they yeah. like, and then you have the consumer army kind of ganging up. So yeah, using them as kind of the <laughs> the lever, the back door to kind of leverage your way in there. That's a clever one, right? On you know, uh, you the best, you can't you can't the, do that. The most efficient way to do that, I argue, is through social networks. Yep. So if you think like a big city like San Diego, which has a lot of surfers, if you could if you can leverage the surfing community to go like annoy the guys at Ralph's who yep. control the San Diego stores for Ralph's. I mean, they'll probably react. Yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> Why <Yeah>. not? <laughs> no, I like that. That's, that's good. Cool. I think this is super interesting. I, uh, yeah, I think got a few notes here. That's, uh, that's super helpful. I want to kind of probably a good place to leave it. If folks kind of, I saw the book, we get that in the back here. If people are watching on video, um, what's some stuff about the book or where can people find you? So the, the book's on Amazon right now, and um, I put it on sale when this airs. So it should be $9.99 paperback on Amazon.com. It's called Ramping Your Brand. Uh, would love for folks to check it out, pass it around. Awesome. I'll link to that in Amazon, and you'll put a link to your social profile. And yeah, if people want to find you, I'll definitely uh, recommend that. Okay. Thanks, Sean. <laughs> awesome. Thanks a bunch.